Thank you all for joining us for our conversation. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to be having this conversation with Jean Marie about her book, To Obama, uh, a president that we fondly remember because the current president is wild. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so this is actually our first real conversation. I'm excited that you're part of this track, Power to the People. And let us just start with the question you've gotten a million times was, uh, why the book? I, I did. I was one of the many people that read your long form piece when oh, it came okay. out. I remember when it came out. Mm -hmm. We all were like, we didn't even know the mailroom was this complicated. Um, and you, you told such an incredible story, not only about the process of choosing the 10 letters for President Obama, but also about the relationships of those people. And that turned into the book. So we'd love to know why a book. Well, first of all, I had no idea that the president had been reading 10 letters a day all eight years while he was in office. I discovered this by accident at the very end of the Obama administration. So we were all gearing up for a new president at this point, you know? Don't remind us. Okay. <laughs> and here I come to find out that the one that's leaving had had this kind of relationship with the citizens that was never really advertised. They didn't make much of a fuss over it. Um, but he had been receiving about 10,000 letters a day and every day, he would end his day by reading 10 of them. So, you know, this raised three immediate questions for me. Number one, who writes to the president? <laughs> really? It's like, kind of like writing to Santa Claus. 10,000 people every single day write to the president. I'm like, oh, whoa, I want to meet these people. Secondly, okay, 10,000 down to 10 every day, how do they pick these? What's the selection? What's this relationship like between these people who are reading this mail and every single piece of mail was read and they're calling through them and how do they decide what they're gonna to give to the president each night? What's that communication? So I tell that story and I tell the first story who writes to the president by going around and meeting people. And then of course the third obvious question was why did President Obama do this. Like, what, this is not normal. Presidents don't do this. Like, he was the first person to have this kind of ritual and a way that he wanted to end every single day by reading what essentially were the stories of the citizens. They weren't like, I don't like your policy about, you know, milk production or something. You know, it was, here's my story. Why did he do that? What was it for him? And also, what does that say about us? and leadership and the role of like active citizenry. So all those questions overwhelmed me. But you have to understand that this was in a period where we really were moving on to a new president, we thought, our first woman. <laughs> and so it was kind of like a nice story. It was like, oh, this will be a sweet sort of end. We can all reflect back. This was now an article for the New York Times Magazine is how this started. Which and you should read if you've not. It is a great article. While I'm reporting it, the election happened, and I went back to the mailroom that morning, and everyone's sobbing. <laughs> and it became a much different story and project when we realized what we were just losing. And uh, the New York Times decided to run it on Inauguration Day for the new president, Donald Trump. And that just really was a kick in the teeth for everyone. <laughs> so it was a very emotional time to run that. And um, it was a great piece to write, but then I really realized I needed to tell the whole story and show, introduce you to these letter writers um, in a much longer format. And that's when we set off to write the book. I have a lot of questions. Uh about some of the content of the book, but some is about process too. What happens to the letters? I'm assuming people probably wrote to Obama after the election yes. of this president, mm -hmm. or the letters got there after he'd already left. Do we know what happens to those letters? That, that were written to Obama? Like after, well, once Trump was in the White House, what happens to the letters? Oh, they still have an active operation in his office in Washington, D.C. Really? You could write to him right now. He'd read it. Obama. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should. We should all write. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him what you're thinking. I love it. Yeah, okay, he still has a, yeah, not to this extent. He's not getting 10,000 every day. Yeah. But. 
Can we talk about the why you chose to organize it chronologically as opposed to, like you could have done themes, mm -hmm. you could have done geography, you could have done, I don't know, a host of other things. Why did you do it? So if you haven't uh, bought the book yet, you should, but it is uh, chronological. So it's 2008, 2009, 9, 10, 10, 12. Why did you choose this structure? Really because I wanted to walk through the eight years. Here's a kind of a portrait of the nation. Um, the letters change as you walk through. I mean, dramatically. The first, the, the, the mail, mind you, you have to imagine there's millions and millions and millions of letters to cull through. And how do you tell the story of a nation through millions and millions and millions of letters? Um, you don't tell it through subject matter because people don't write in according to subject matter. It's not like we all sit around and say, oh, I'm a healthcare advocate, so I'm going to join the team of people writing about healthcare. I mean, it's just a smattering. It's like chaos, voices, like constantly thrown at the president. So I wanted to sort of like capture what that was like. You know, you're sitting there and just smattering of voices flooded um, over periods of time. So what does that show us as we walk through the eight years of the Obama administration? It gives you a portrait of America over that time period. So we kind of blocked them like that and walked through. Was there a period that you saw the biggest shift? In the mail? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, the, the biggest shift you see is, um, I think, towards the end. Interesting. When people are starting, the, yeah, a different tone. The, the beginning shift, the beginning is desperation. Um, there's an economic crisis. Everyone's losing faith in the Catholic Church. Everything, it seemed like all the systems were collapsing when Obama first took office. Banks are collapsing. Everything's people are writing in desperate. So you get that kind of mail. And if you switch that all the way with the end mail, which is just overwhelming thanks and legacy. And here's what happened to me. My grandfather's, my grandfather has been in love with this man for the 17 years he's been living with him. And I got to go to their wedding because of you. Hmm. Um, kind of like, here's what your policies did for me or for my family. Um, lots of that. Now, of course, there's lots of anger in there as well. It's not just happy love. Um, but it's like, here's, here's what you did for me personally. Got it. Uh, chapter 12 opens, uh, chapter 12 is, twi is entitled Friends of the Male. And this was a part of the process that I actually had no clue about, like the other people in the White House who had access to it. And you talk about Cody, and I'll tell you a story about the speechwriters later, but um, can you talk about the Friends of the Mail? Because that was something that I learned. I was like, wow, I didn't even, I didn't even know this was a thing. Well, that's the thing. It's like this whole thing started for Obama just as a way of like keeping in touch with the people. But what ended up happening was because he cared, he, the mail was so important to him, um, you know, really it was. Uh, it became important to everybody in the White House. It's like, if it's important to the boss, you gotta be taking it seriously too. So what it ended up happening was, you know, this is just the mail room, this is the basement. Um, no one paid attention to the mail room before, but now they were, you know, they're getting all this mail every day and it's getting circulated around the, around the, um, the West Ring, uh, around the Oval Office. This is, uh, you know, this is his right hand man. This is his, speechwriter today, this is his speechwriter tomorrow, he's handing out these letters. Read this one. This is what I meant. This is what I meant. We got to do something with this one. Do you hear what this woman is saying? That kind of stuff. So it became like a conversation um, around the White House that was just started with the mail. I love it. I love it. I want to ask you, what is something that you learned about the process that you wouldn't have even imagined before you started on this? And I ask because you know, I'm, a, I'm a protester, and the protests were happening during his, and I'll ask you about some of those letters, because yeah. there are letters in here uh, that reference that period of time. But uh, one of the things that wasn't publicized is that the speechwriters actually had these off-the-record meetings with people about the State of the Union in the middle of the night at the White House. Mm -hmm. So I get this invitation to the White House at 7, 7.30 p.m. We go in very quietly. We meet with some of the speechwriters, and we essentially lobby for language we want him to use in the State of the Union, but we do it in the middle of the night so that like the press won't know and da da da. And that is a part of the process of that White House. And I just literally, I wouldn't have, I would have never guessed that, you know? That's wild. What is, uh, what is something that you learned about the way that this worked that like you wouldn't have even been able to guess? 
I do think that I would not have been able to guess that they were they were passing these letters around. Uh, you know, here's here's Natona Canfield, and she has cancer, and the individual I guess stories that made it as part of the daily conversation in the mailroom was really surprising to me. But honestly, the most surprising to me was the fact of these people, these forgotten people, not forgotten, but unknown. They didn't even want to be known. They were just mailroom people. Um, so in, in, incredibly impacted by this mail. I mean, they had counselors ready for them hmm. because there were people writing in that, you know, that, that were, their father was about to commit suicide and President Obama, can you help me? And what can you tell me about the personal nature of this mail? What it did to those people who were reading it and what they felt their responsibility was to deliver that to the, to the boss. And in the essay, in the essay you write about is the red dot or the red, mm -hmm. is a red dot? Red dots were the letters that were emergencies. Those are the ones that immediately you had to deal with. You were a person who read a red dot letter, it was an emergency. So for example, Ashley DeLeon, she's a, it's a beautiful letter in there, a young college student who writes this letter about, you know, it's Christmas Eve, she's at home. Dear Mr. President, I wanna tell you about what happened Christmas Eve and when my father started shooting the guns and I had to get my brother out of the house because the shooting wouldn't stop and I didn't know why he was shooting but I got my brother out of the house and then I ran into my father's room because I knew what he was going to do. He was going to shoot himself because it finally had come to this. And Mr. President, I just want to tell you what that was like. And you know, it goes on from there. Her, her father had been a Marine suffering from PTSD so severely he was, he, has, he had you know, lost his, his mind in the most violent way and Ashley, she saved her father she saved her brother, and she wanted to tell Obama this. She wasn't complaining. She was saying, look, my family died that night. We're destroyed. You need to do something for all the other families like mine. Like, you need to do something for them. You need to help them. And that was the reason she wrote that letter. But that was a red dot, because they were worried about this woman. And so they immediately sent it to, you know, the caseworkers to call her. And they did, they sent, they sent help for her dad, they sent help for her, and you know, why did she choose to write to the president? You know, was the question I had. Were emails treated the same as regular mail? Like would you, as a person writing in, did I have a better shot if I wrote a hard copy or an email? <laughs> <laughs> you probably had a better shot if you read a, wrote hard copy. Really? Yeah. Um, because they were sort of more precious. They were objects that were, that were um, coming in like in the handwriting and the, just a note paper and people would put stickers all over it and there was just something mm. so like actual, like this is, a, this is a piece of me and I'm giving it to you. So people tended to feel that if you took the time to do that, there's something special going on here. So, I mean, all the mail was special, but I would say that stuff got to people. And I know in, even in the original essay, you talk about uh, your conversation with Obama, and I'll never forget meeting him. We had two meetings with him, and uh, it, he very much was like the man you saw on TV. You write about the pensiveness and <laughs> how, uh, you know, if you've seen Obama talk, it feels like the words sort of like slowly come out. Uh, they slowly come out in person too, and <laughs> you write Now, were you overwhelmed by that when you talked to him? Did you find like, what, don't you, can't you speed up? I mean, I think I was actually shocked by, did he chew gum when you met with him? He has that nicotine gum. He has the gum. All the time. That like, you'll never see, you, you see it in person, you see it, but like on TV, you never see it. I think I was struck with that. He's also really skinny. He's so skinny. He's so skinny. <laughs> In a way that, like, you don't. TV, I was a little worried. I, yeah, I, but then you saw, I saw him on TV like the next week. And he, he TV really does add pounds. Like it, he <laughs> um, doesn't look as skinny. Uh, but it was. Uh, but one of the things that was clear to me in meeting him, we had two meetings with him, is that um, people are just really different around him. You yeah. know, people a little less honest. I found. You know, I met with him because of the protests. But they like were a little less honest and a little more thank you y. And, uh, but you had, you had time with him to talk about uh, an issue that he rarely probably got asked questions about, partly because people didn't even know this process existed. Uh, what did you 
what did you go in thinking? And did you, were you, did you do what you wanted to do in the room with him? Like, did you ask the questions that you thought? Uh, what did you leave being like, you know, I wish I'd probably said this? Well, you don't get to ask a lot of questions because he takes a long time to answer. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you know, I had a few. First of all, I was really surprised. This is, you got to remember, this is at the very end. He's leaving office. He's busy. So my request, can we talk about, about the mail room? Would you mind? <laughs> I'm really, honestly, I'm thinking, good luck, lady. You know, really. Where was the meeting? This was in, the first one was in the Oval Office. And then the second one was after um, he had left office. So there were, you know, sort of like during and after. And in both cases, I was surprised he wouldn't talk about the mail. So that told me a lot. Like this mail thing that he's choosing to talk about this told me a lot. And my questions were really basic, you know, like, why do you, what were you thinking? Why were you reading this mail? Um, and I had a few letters I wanted to ask about in particular. But you do only get a few questions out because he's thinking so hard. And <laughs> that is you know, and he's so interesting. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not, he's not a politician. Honestly, I kept thinking, if you're going to make it in this business, you're going to get like a little snappier. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, so in our meeting, he, um, it was the first intergenerational meeting of civil rights leaders in the, hosted by the president in the wow. house. So we're in the Roosevelt Room, right off the Oval Office. And the first set of, everybody goes around, and the first set of people are so effusive in their praise of yeah. Obama that he literally has to say in the middle, he says, I know you guys like me, but I need you to stop saying thank you because we got to get to the work. And you're like, you're so adorable. Um, <laughs> can we go to the section that is the protest years, like 206, 207? There are a set of uh, letters that come up around uh, his speech in Charleston. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a set of letters that come up around sort of interactions or, or with law enforcement. Like this whole section is sort of like mm -hmm. what I consider to be the protest sure. section. Did you see, um, did you see him? I want to believe that there was a market change in the tone of letters that would have come in that period. Is that just me wanting that because I'm a protester or was that real? Oh, no, that was absolutely real. You know, you get a flood of, of those kinds of letters that... I mean, it was all reacting to the events of the, of, the, of the moment. And you've got to figure that people are writing when they're emotional. You know, they're not writing, you know, something's just happened they're either really angry about or really happy about. And so those letters are really coming, you know, they're visceral. Yep. But also, the, the ones that really struck me, I don't, I'll tell you about, um, for example, because I, I kept going like, why are you writing to the president? with all your problems? Um, or why do you think the president wants to read what you have to say? I, I was just so interested in that. And there's so, so take Marge McKinney, this old woman um, in North Carolina. Um, and, and you'll remember during the, um, the Trayvon Martin uh, horrible shooting. So she writes a letter to the president during that period. Um, and what she wants to do is she wants to tell him a story about herself as a, you know, a woman who grew up in the South, who one day was visiting Albany, New York, on an errand for her husband, walking out of a library late at night. It was rainy and dark, and no one was out on the street except for her. And she found herself fearful because someone was approaching her. And so she became more and more fearful and he was getting closer and closer, and she saw that he was a black man, and he had a hoodie on, and so she panicked and didn't know what to do, and she wanted to run. She got to the door where he was headed, and he turned to her and said, boy, it sure is windy outside, isn't it? And you know what? There's, a, there's a, an easier way to get to the parking lot if you knew. You could just go underneath. And that's why he was approaching her to help her. Mm -hmm. She was so devastated to find that she, she said to me, I, I found I was a racist. I was afraid of this guy because he was black and he had no intention other than to help me. What's the matter with me? And what do I do with that 
what I discovered in myself. And what she did with it was write to President Obama and apologize. <laughs> and she said, you know, I think there's a lot of people like me. We don't think that we're racist, but it comes out and I'm so sorry. And this was right around when Trayvon Martin got killed by a guy who, you know, Zimmerman, who assumed the worst of him, he's just coming home from a store, assumed the worst and shot him and killed him. And Marge related to this guy who shot and said, President Obama, there's something wrong with us. There's a problem with us and we need to, we need to do something. And this is why she was writing to him. It was almost like her confession, her prayer. He wrote back to her and thanked her and said, you know, Marge, it's people like you who give me hope because you called this out on yourself and noticed it. And you know what Marge did as an 80-year-old woman from that exchange? That's all the exchange was. She said, I'm going to start going to marches. I'm going to start meeting other people like me. That's dope. And she started, she couldn't find marches near her. She's like, where are the marches? Yes, Marge. Go ahead, Marge. How do, you get, how do you get to these marches? And so she had to like research it, and then she figured out there was no NA, NAACP chapter in her whole county. She started one. And that's how she answered President Obama. I mean, that's just like that little exchange. One old woman finding something in herself, telling a president, and then acting on it. To me, that was, should be what America is. I love it. Were people generally receptive when you reached out to them about their letters? Oh, yes. <laughs> You're like, they can't stop talking about it. They would, no, so many people cried. Oh, really? So many people cried. Because they felt phone. heard and seen or because they... Can you believe he read my letter? Can you believe he answered me? Like... Did you visit their home? Were they like shrines to the letter, you know? <laughs> many people, many, a lot of frames from Walmart. <laughs> yeah. I love it. It meant a lot. I mean, gee, yeah. I tabbed it, but I can't find it. There's that one letter where the guy's like, um, I want to be a writer. I'm afraid to write, but I wrote this one sentence. You know what I'm talking about, that yeah, letter? Yeah, as a woman, yeah. A woman. There's like this letter that literally is like, um, it's oh. very short. It's like, I want to be a writer. I'm afraid to write, um, but I wrote this letter to you. And he wrote back. And Obama writes back and is like, I read it. Essentially, is like, I read it, you know? <laughs> but, I, but I bring that up because I was actually shocked that such a mundane letter like made it into the pile, you know? Two things to say about that. Number one, that woman's name, Gretchen, Gretchen El Hassani. She appeared at a book event with me about six months ago because I loved that letter. It was like three How sentences. How amazing is that? That's great that she know. showed up at a book talk. She showed up and I said, Gretchen, how's your writing? And she said, well, I'm still so afraid. And I said, well, Gretchen, you just got to get to it. <laughs> anyway, I just heard from her about a week ago. Her book is done. Shut up. I love it. She wrote her book. And it was, oh, well, it was a lot of things, but... Yes, Obama wrote back and said, get to it, Gretchen. <laughs> anyway, yeah, how, how amazing that that letter got chosen. And that said a lot about what I loved about that mailroom. You know, they get all this mail and it could be, you know, dramatic and this and that and this. But sometimes they were just little moments. And they wanted a representative sample for him, the president, to have it every night. This is what America is saying. And sometimes they were that little, like, but it's huge to her. Um, but he, you know, it was like, feed him these moments. They didn't have to be the most dramatic, newsworthy moment. They were personal moments. That was really representative. I'm so glad you put that one out. It was a, it was a great one. And what, what it also made me think about, too, and I wanted to ask you this so you could tell us all, is what was the difference between him choosing? Because he hand wrote that response. Right. It was not a typed and signed response. Mm -hmm. So what was the difference between the handwritten responses that were wholly handwritten from Obama and the ones that were typed and signed? Well, first of all, the wholly written from Obama were wholly written from Obama. I mean, you know, he wrote in longhand. Um, and most of those, 
especially in the early days, we use a lot of them in, in, the, in the book, <laughs> were um, the really angry letters, the people who were really mad at him. And he would write those one back in hand in great detail. <laughs> And like explaining like his policy and why he made these choices. Like, you know, dear Harry in Iowa, let me tell you why I chose to do that. And you read these, and you're like, are you kidding me? You could, you're spending all this time on Harry in Iowa. <laughs> but when, they, when people were angry, angry and he felt misunderstood, hmm. he was going to answer, he answered right then, let me tell you what I really meant. Um, but then as time went on, you see le the letters become <laughs> a lot shorter. I think he realized like, oh, I can't keep this up. Um, and certainly he had a large staff. Um, they were kind of like the, the, the underground, the letter underground. They were, they, they were like the elves. They called themselves the elves. Um, and Obama would write all his notes on the sides of those letters. And there was one woman there, Colby, 23 years old. This was her job to write, to translate those notes into a letter from in the president's voice. Didn't she work in like a secret, it was like a room that people didn't, this was the woman, right? Yes. She worked up in the attic, 23 years old, all by herself, right? and I'm like, Colby, how do you have the courage to write in the voice of the President of the United States? Colby, 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 where does this come from? And she said, she, she explained to me, well, I just listened to his speeches my whole childhood. They were my favorite thing to do was listen to his speeches. And I just kind of got used to the way he talked. <laughs> That's what it was. But she was great at it. So he would say, okay, I'm going to personally write to these people. And then the other one, she would craft. The yes. Responses. Or there was a team. But, but when I was there, she was the one that was in charge at that point. Yeah. And what did you learn about the architecture of the operation, given that they, create, they created like an apparatus? Was this like the brainchild of one person to do this? Like, we're going to organize it this way? Or... You know, you write about the um, all the letters got tagged or coded in mm -hmm. pencil, and then the pencil was erased. Like, was did it? Did this just sort of was this happenstance that the architecture was built this way, or was this like a McKinsey plan or something? I don't know. This was deliberate because y you have to understand they got there, <laughs> and there was no apparatus for mail. There was nothing. They didn't even have a. They didn't even have stationery. I mean, the Bush administration. They, everybody clears out when a new president comes in. You just clear out. And they arrive, the new, you know, the new group, and there are boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of letters all over the place. They're like, what are we going to do with all this mail? And here the president wants to read 10 of them a day, and like, how are we going to do this? And really, there was a, there was a machine that was invented to, 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 to figure out how to do this. And they were, um, yeah, oh man, the people who started that never left. They were so devoted to that mail. It wasn't that they were devoted to Obama, although they were, but it was like, we have to elevate these voices. This is our, this is our duty to our country, to elevate the voices, and how can we do that? Um, and so this apparatus evolved, and you know, 300 volunteers, and God knows how many interns, and st I don't know, 60 staffers. It was quite a large operation that they created, and at the end, which is when I was there, they were preparing um, the Bible, kind of like the notes, to pass this along for the next president. Um, so that the, the, they, they had created this thing. Uh, he's not reading much these days. You know, they were, and they were so, I was there, they were so ready to, to pass it on. And, and, you know, all their transition materials, and. And I was there that day after uh, the day after the election, and I'm like, okay, here's all the transition materials. Who are we giving them to? And they made some phone calls, and like nobody wanted them. And I don't know that anyone ever did read them. So, I often get the question, is anybody reading the mail now? And all I can tell you is I've written so many letters, <laughs> <laughs> and I've never gotten anything. Nothing. <laughs> I wanted to ask, you know, I think about in writing my own book, I'm always mindful of other things that weren't included, the things that, you know, you, you start the process and you're like, we're definitely going to talk about this. And then by the time the book comes out, it's just not there. So <laughs> would love to know, what was that for you? What were some of the things that you went into it being like, definitely going to include this thing or this letter or this anecdote or this story? 
And in the end, it just didn't make the cut. Oh, there were so many letters. You just can't imagine. You fell in love with one after the next after the next. And we, we went around the country visiting these people, and they were so uh, eager to share their stories of what kind of like life had been for them during the eight years of that administration. And every one was a window into who we are as America. And it was really hard to edit out you know, it was getting fatter and fatter and fatter, this book. I'm like, how many letters can we include? So it was really hard to, to cut out some of, those, some of those stories, although we're now doing a podcast um, with Is a it lot of... Is Obama? Yes. Uh, well, it keeps changing the title, but it, 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 it'll be obvious when it comes out. Okay. Um, with a lot of the... Letters to Obama. I think it might be the mailroom. Obvious, okay. That works. I'm not in charge of the title. Just the content. But we have a lot of um, the interviews, the original audio um, of, of a lot of these folks, and the original audio of the staffers talking about um, picking those 10 letters, you know, the person in charge, Fiona, um, picking each, each day. Did she stay all eight years? She was there the whole time. What's she doing now, do you know? She had a baby. And she was really emotional at the end. Um, it was really hard for her to, to leave that position and feeling like, my letter writers, my letter writers, my letter writers, I'm leaving them. That's how she felt. Um, so she's taking a little break. Um, anyway, she, uh, you know, she was in charge. She was, she was, she talked about it um, as passing a, uh, a tray under the door every night. You know, it was like her gift to Obama. And then she'd get a tray back, kind of like, and here's my responses. They never talked. They never, they never talked about the letters. It was just kind of like, here's what I have for you today. And, you know, maybe you've had a bad day, and that's why I gave you this kid letter at the end that just wants to know about the dog. You know, <laughs> like, you know or, now, or maybe this is a day that I, Fiona, am angry at you for what you did about, you know, X policy. So I'm going to give you a lot of healthcare cranky letters. <laughs> you know, she had communication. She was, it was such a experience. That's so awesome. Yeah, like, that was a communication itself. But I do want to know about one that didn't make it in. One of the letters that didn't make yeah, like it in? Yeah, like something that didn't make it. Oh, man, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I didn't get to tell enough about probably... Um, one family, um, well, I mean, they're in there, but not enough. Uh, I could have written the whole book about one family hmm. I visited at the very end who wrote, uh, it was Vicki Shearer and her family. Um, they wrote a letter, um, Vicki did. She lived in Renton, Washington, the state of Washington, the day after uh, the election when she found out that um, Trump won. And she wrote to the president, Dear Mr. President, I'm writing to you because my family's now falling apart. My husband voted for Trump. My, hus my son is gay. My daughter-in-law is a Mexican-American. Our whole family feels that my husband has betrayed us. And we're falling apart. And what are we going to do? And to me, that letter was so representative of what people were going through during that period of time when we all were, f everybody I knew was like afraid to go home for Thanksgiving. You know, they didn't want to talk to their, their, their families for fear that, who'd you vote for? Who'd you vote for? We were so divided so immediately. And that family I spent a lot of time with, um, you know, watching them heal. And they did. And they did. And watching sort of like the communication between them open where they were able to sort of like forgive each other and try and move forward, which was really a story of the nation where we are right now, although we're not nearly as far along as Vicky's family. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry to say. We are not. We are still struggling. We are not. So that, you know, it's like, so moments like that, I feel like I, 
I would have liked to have stayed with much longer and, and unpack and unpack and unpack, you know, where we are now, really. And how did this process change you? Like, what were, what were some of the lessons you learned or that you took away as like a person, as a writer? This is not your first writing, you know, you are a writer. Uh, how did the process change you? I think it really awakened for me this notion of, I guess, active citizenship. You know, when you meet all these people who took the time to say something to their leader, to have that kind of, to form a relate, an actual relationship with whoever it is that you're, you, you voted for or didn't vote for, um, and speak up and speak out and speak to them, I would have never thought, I would have thought, well, who cares what I have to say? Um, and I feel now a responsibility hmm. to speak up, and even in the smallest ways, you know? Um, be, be present in a democracy, you know? It's like, I think it taught me a lot about democracy and, and my role in it, not just as a, rece a recipient of, yay, I'm an American. It's like, whoa, what is my responsibility here? I think that it elevated for me uh, tremendously. I think one of the things I learned too from it was that there are so many people in their homes who realize that they have power. There's so many people who mm. like, realize that like their voice means something at least to them and they're willing to share that, which seems so, mm -hmm. you're like, who's writing letters? You know, it's like actually a ton of people are. You're like, <laughs> a ton of people are writing letters. I want to know too, and this was my, my curiosity, was there any letter, what I, I want to, I'm trying to figure out if there was like some dissonance between like the letter and the people you met, right? Mm. So like, you read this letter and you're like, okay, then you meet them and you're like, okay, didn't think you like <laughs> seem like, uh, you're like, okay, that was interesting. Was there, did you find that at all? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you read the letters and you kind of become, you fall like a little bit in love with any a writer. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you did with the letter writers. And um, he's so cute. He's so adorable. He's like a poet. And then you get there. <laughs> and you're like, hmm, Whoa. this is interesting. A little too poetic, aren't you now? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and you kind of know what to do with that. Yeah, I had a, I had a few of those experiences. <laughs> Anyone that stands out? Well, all right. I mean, I still love him dearly. I really do. The very first letter in here, which is the first letter that ever I wanted to, because one of the reasons I want to write the book, I love this letter so much. Bobby Ingram from Oxford, Mississippi, and he is a poet, even though he doesn't know it. Um, his letter is so beautiful. Uh, he writes during the economic crisis, writing to Dear President Obama, I'm writing to you because basically I'm out of work and you know all the things that, that so many Americans had at this moment. But the way he chose to write the letter was he wrote about his hands. He wanted to tell the president about the fact that the calluses were gone from his hands. And he was, a, he was a, a land surveyor that worked, you know, with his hands, you know, and digging, and, and now he had no more calluses. And so he wanted the president to know what it was like now to miss those hands, now that there was nothing left of them, and his whole identity was his hands. And, and then he, and this is just as President Obama's coming into office, and he ends the letter with, I clutch my hands together now in prayer that you'll help us. So it's a prayer, essentially. It's just so beautifully written. Um, but I got down to Oxford, Mississippi, and, you know, Bobby had a lot more problems than that. <laughs> you know, um, it was much sadder hmm. and maybe more tragic even though his life had kind of gotten together, but the darkness kind of of his experience. Um, it was just really hard to witness. Did you get a sense of what he thought Obama could do for him, or was the letter writing catharsis, or? It was definitely catharsis, mind you. I also found out he wrote about, oh my gosh, it took him about four months, draft after draft after draft after draft after draft to get it perfect. Wow. Not only that, he mailed it, trying to time it, so it would be the first letter that got to Obama's desk the first day he sat down in office. He lucked he, out. 
I mean, he really... It, and he traced the mail route and timed it. That's intense. Now, it did... It, it, yeah, it, it was so very intense. <laughs> so, you know, it meant a lot. That's interesting. Well, we'll open it up now for the crowd, but let's give you a round of applause. Thank you oh. so much. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to leave... Uh, I wanted to leave time for questions because I could speak to her forever. Uh, let us, uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand and we have the mic runner, we have mic runners right here. There's a question. Thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much. Try it again. Thank you ever so much. That was <laughs> fascinating. Um, you've obviously got to spend time going over all of these letters. What was the most memorable response from Obama? The most memorable response? Oof. It's always hard because there's so many, honestly. So I like pick one out and then I go, oh, well, maybe it was that one. Um, this is a kind of a, maybe a small one, but, a, but a, a memorable response in that it had such an impact. A woman named Marnie ha Hazelton had um, ri written to the, to the president because she had been um, just fired. She was a school teacher, um, just fired from her job, and she was angry. She was actually, as I learned later, wildly drunk. <laughs> in her anger, she was just drinking and mad and blaming anyone and everyone for the fact that, you know, that, that she had been laid off. And she um, fired off this letter to the president saying, you know, it's all your fault, it's, it's everybody. <laughs> she was mad. Um, and she got back a response, dear Marnie, you know, handwritten, I'm, I'm sorry that you're, ex this, you're going through this, I want you to know you know, nice thought, nice thought, nice thought. I'm rooting for you, Barack Obama. So Marnie, this note, talk about framed in the house. Marnie took this, I'm rooting for you. Whew. Everywhere she went, every job interview, everything. <laughs> I'm rooting for you, I'm rooting for you, I'm rooting for you. So you know what ends up happening to Marnie? She not only finally, a year later, gets the job back, she gets promoted and promoted and promoted and right now is superintendent of the school district that laid her off. Shut up. And she will hold that up and say, he was rooting for me. <laughs> oh, that's great. So that was a good one. That was a good story. Any other questions we see right here? I see you. I wonder if you have any thoughts on Can you hold whether, it closer? Sorry. I wonder if you have any thoughts on whether the, the sentiments um, and the humanity, really, that is obviously in the book, is um, a reflection of Obama as an individual, or is it a reflection of perhaps more empathetic times? And um, whichever it is, I wonder if you have any thoughts on how long it might take for something like that to happen Again? <laughs> I have so many thoughts about everything you just said. Um, I think a lot of what I learned um, in this whole experience is about sort of like the, I talked to Obama about this actually, um, the role of empathy in politics. Um, is there one? Yes, for him there was, clearly. Um, but I talked to him a lot about, you know, well, should there be? I mean, what, what is empathy? It's great to have an, someone who feels, does that make you a good leader? We talked a lot about that. And, you know, he, had a, he was not at all challenged by that question. In fact, he loved that question because he said, you know, the way I think about empathy is, you know, the role of empathy in, 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 in for him um, as a president was the same as the role of uh, empathy of any community leader, any community organizer. 
um, wh wh where relationships are formed at the most basic level um, is where we begin as a society to, to, be to create a democracy. Um, it's not that it makes you a great leader, it's that it's what it creates around you. Um, and so I think a lot about, you know, was it the time or was it the leader? Clearly it was the leader. I mean, these people were writing to a, a president, you know, like Marge, she's writing to a guy who she thinks, this is who I need to confess to. Um, she's doing this because of his leadership, of, of what he communicated to, you know, this is my role, um, to listen. Um, and listening is how we create communities. So it was him, clearly, I believe. Um, is Marge going to write to Donald Trump? <laughs> and I mean, this is like, no matter what your politics are, that is, that is not a value, listening. Of that of that leader, so you know, yeah, just saying I I I'm I'm listening and I mean it, and he did. That's the whole ball game right there, because now we you know. So the question then is like, how long is it going to take us to get back there? The thing I think about is, you know, this is not a depressing book to me. This is really a book of hope. Um, this is a really a book of like, oh. We had this. It wasn't that long ago. I like it was not long ago. <laughs> we lived like this. And don't forget. And it, as an American, my role is like this is what I'm voting for when I want someone new. I you know, here's an example. Um, this is why I vote. This is why I ask for what what we need as a as a country to heal. Um, all of us together as a active citizen. So I think it's kind of like, all, well, even as Obama said to me, you know, over to you, citizens. Uh, it's kind of over to us, you know? Right. Uh, down here in front. Uh, just two very quick questions. Um, one, did you require Mr. Obama's permission to write the book? And two, are the replies in the book? Um, did I require his permission to, to write? write the book? Um, I didn't have to have his permission, but I sure had to have the permission um, to root through his mail. <laughs> <laughs> and I did ask him for that permission, and he did grant that. So that was huge, you know, like, okay, go ahead, root through my mail. And then, of course, all the permission from every single letter writer. Um, and then, what was the second question? I forgot. Oh, the reply. The replies are in the book, yes, and they're beautiful. The replies, and especially in his own handwriting, you really you get a feel of someone really there. Lots of replies in the book. Uh, back here, I see you, and I see you. Yeah, we're back in the back with our hands up. Um, it's kind of a two-part question. Um, do you think reading these letters is what made him the president that we know him as? And do you think if Trump were to do this, he would gain some semblance of empathy, even a little bit? <laughs> well, I can tell you what Obama said about for him reading the letters. You know, he said to me, this started as a way for me to kind of keep in touch with, you know, the, the, the people who elected me to office. That's what I thought this was about. Um, but he said that the surprise for him as he was leaving office, he said, this really sustained me. You know, that this, for him, it was, it, he, he was doing it for them, but it turned out to be for him, the part that surprised him, that it kept him alive. He felt, I, I haven't lost myself, and I think part of it is because of the letters. I thought that was a pretty interesting statement. Um, and then, you know, I don't know how you teach someone empathy I think the very first thing it has to be the will. And that's like uh, somebody way upstairs in charge of that. It, yeah. I don't know. I, don't, I, <laughs> I have nothing to say about him. Okay. Um, I saw you, you right here. Yeah, right there. I'm fascinated by numbers. How does 10,000 become 10 <laughs> in one day? 
10,000 down to 10. I was too. So imagine an army of people in a big room with mail everywhere. Um, everybody's reading, 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 reading. They're coding. Every letter gets a code on top, kind of what the subject matter is, you know, immigration. And um, that's the first thing. That's kind of the first screening, just what the subject is. They're, they're, they're tossing out mail that is just, you know, like mean, I hate you because you're a bad guy. You know, like some of it get, gets tossed, but very little. Um, and then for those individual people reading, whether it was an intern, didn't matter your station in that White House, if it moved you, you wrote S on it, and that meant sample. And it meant anything could move you, however it moved you emotionally. That meant pull it aside and put it in a special box. Um, and so everybody's reading, 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 coding. Oh, this one moves me. They're doing it back. By the end of the day, there would be about 300 of those, maybe, that people had found that were moving to them. All 300 of those goes to the mailroom matron, Fiona, who sits on her couch at 4 o'clock, takes all those 300 or 200, however many moved the staff, and she reads them and starts saying yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. A lot of it is just a matter of, it, it is, it's personal. Here's what I think he needs to know. And um, she was in charge of then that final 10. And uh, boy, did she feel a responsibility. Not only did she feel a responsibility for picking the 10, then she ordered them very carefully so that he would read this one first, this one second. It was like a book of poems every and day. And you asked him too, does he read them in her, in her order? I did. I said, do you really read them in that order? He said, oh, I do. <laughs> you know, if this was the way Fiona says I'm supposed to read them, so I'm going to read them. <laughs> so I'm like, that's remarkable that... That, that relationship the two of them had was fascinating. And was Valerie Fiona's supervisor? Who was her manager? Uh, Fiona's? Yeah. Um, not Valerie Jarrett, although, you know, she was like one of the, the fancy people that would also read the mail. Friends um, of the mail. Friends of, she was a friend, yeah. She was a friend of the mail. Um, okay, we'll do right here and then red. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a particular question about a particular letter. Um, I don't know whether it's in the paperback. It's certainly on the end cover of the hardback from a young person. I think um, starts off, Dear President Obama, I have something important to tell you. And ends Emily, age six. I just wonder whether you might tell us a little bit about that letter. because. Oh, I, you know, it's so short. How about I just read it real quick? Please, please do. Dear President Obama, I have something very important to tell you. Well, my mom had cancer and she went to my school to vote for you with a wheelchair because she wanted you to be president. And she was proud and happy that day. She is in heaven now and prays for you to be safe and me too. Your friend, Emily. I am seven years old, just like Sasha. Bye. Emily, so President Obama writes back, Emily, thanks for the wonderful letter. My mom died of cancer too, so I know how you feel. I'm sure your mom and mine are both in heaven and are both proud of you. I am too. Dream big dreams, Barack Obama. Just a kid letter. He answered those too. Red? His name's not really red, but he's wearing red. And <laughs> it would just, it's just easier so we don't get confused, you know. It's like the red guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, see, he got it. He got it. Picking up what I'm putting down. There you go. Fascinating talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, just a, a, a quick question. I was interested in a, a different relationship, the relationship between um, uh, Mr. Obama and his wife. I wonder whether he ever shared any of these stories uh, with his wife, whether he took them home at all. Um, did you ever get any sense of that? He talked a lot about that. Yeah, he, I mean, I guess... That's I, a great he, question, by the way. That was good. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, I like, 
he would carry these letters around. This was like normal for him. He, you know, he, he would he would have a stack of them at any given moment, and it, it would, you know, he was always reading them at home in the residence anyway. It was the last thing he did at night. You know, like this is the way he ended his days. Like some people say a prayer, maybe he did that too, but he was ending his day with these letters. So he was talking about them with anyone who was around, and of course, his wife as well, and his kids. You know. I mean, this was like a part of the, the fabric of, of the day. Um, you know, hey, here's what, you know, Sophia just told me. Her mom died of cancer. Can you believe that? That, that was just a natural piece of the conversation that went on throughout that White House. We have time for two more questions, and then we will uh, let her off the stage. Right here. I just want to say, hail to Pitt. Oh, thank you so much. University of Pittsburgh, I have a friend here. <laughs> <laughs> um, since you're close to it, close to, I can't even see her, him, they, I don't know, I can't Hi. see. Hi, okay. I was very moved by the effect of these letters on the choices of career people took after leaving the mailroom. Would you be able to speak a bit more about that? Sure. Um, a lot of these people, you know, as I mentioned, were so moved. The people who worked in the mailroom, who were on the front line of this, you know, receiving this day after day after day, and a lot of these red dot letters, for example. Um, the woman who handled Ashley's letter, um, the one whose father was in a, in a moment of, of about to kill himself, um, her, she, 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 that, that letter changed her life forever. I mean, she will stand up here and tell you that. Um, and she chose to have a career in working with uh, mental health and uh, veterans. Um, as soon as she left the White House, she pursued that, and that's where she is today, helping veterans get medical benefits. I mean, it couldn't be more <laughs> on the nose than that, um, and it really came from Ashley in that letter. That, that, I, you heard that story over and over and over again. I mean, these people came into these jobs as, you know, some of them as interns, college interns and some of them just out of college. So, so they're just, they, they, they didn't even know anything about the world yet, hardly. Um, and this is the way they started <laughs> their, their professional lives. And, um, you know, what a, what, a, what a way to begin your, your sense of yourself as a participant in the grand experiment of America. Everybody, let's give it up for <laughs> Hugh Obama. Make sure you get it, Jean Marie. I did know about Jean Marie Laskis. Um, she wrote in the Reader's Digest for many years. She's written in the New York Times and the New Yorker. I was very familiar with her, but most especially because she wrote the uh, book that uh, Concussion that the movie was made out of. And she's from Pittsburgh, and so am I. So I knew all about the football players getting the chronic traumatic encephalopathy and and you know ending up in terrible condition. So that was a great movie, and she wrote the book that the movie was based on. So yes, I knew about her. That was a book my wife and myself both read about um, a month ago. And by total coincidence, we saw it was coming up in the festival. And so we were particularly thrilled, having read the book and been very moved by it, to the opportunity actually to come and hear, um, hear her speak and be interviewed today. And uh, Joy, the session was terrific, I have to say. It fascinated me that he did, that, that actually President Obama actually spent time speaking to the people by writing to them and taking time to do that. I didn't know about it because I'd read about it before, but um, no, it's fascinating. <laughs>